All right, everyone, welcome back to another weekly roundup edition of On the Margin. Today, uh, we are sadly missing Mr. Mark Yusko, which I usually say in my intro, but uh, the bright side is I'm joined by my colleague, Mr. Jack Farley. Jack, welcome to the show, man. Mike, it's great to be back, as always. So, so when you and I do these collabs, should we be calling this forward marginal guidance? Is that the is that our celeb couple name? You know, Mike, you're the boss. You're the co-founder of BlockWorks. Your show is on the margin. We'll call it on the margin. But, Mike, I was watching Bloomberg this morning, and a single guest mentioned forward guidance probably at least five times, and they used the phrase on the margin as many times as well. So I just love the fact that our podcasts get free advertising every you know, anytime anyone else talks. Love it. We're just so savvy, Jack. We're just so savvy. Here's here's the real question is who we're both going to be at DAX, Mike? right, which is coming to New York uh, September 13th and 14th. We both have codes. We're both in this competition. We've got Mike 250. We've got Jack 250. Which one are we going to use for the show here? Which one are we going to talk about? Oh, I mean, again, you're, you're the boss. I think it's got to be Mike 250. Um, <laughs> yeah, people people got to use sign up codes. It's, it's tough to attribute. I feel like a lot of people they look up, they hear about it via our podcast, and then they look it up, and then they use some different code. Um, but yeah, we, we, people have got to sign up um, to DOS. It's going to be epic. Um, honestly, uh, I'm, I think the the best panel of the day, of the, the whole conference potentially, is the one that you're leading, the macro crystal ball. Really all-star lineup there. You got Alf, you got Mike Green, you got Danielle DeMartino Booth. Just going to be an all-star panel there. Um, so and enough of the, the shilling and pumping, guys. Click the link in the show notes. Uh, we'd love to see you at DAS. Uh, you'll meet me and Jack there. Um, I want to talk about our first story. We've got a bunch of charts for you today, as per usual. We're going to be talking a little bit about energy, a little bit about the FO, or the um, the meeting at the Jackson Hole meeting, which is we're recording this on Thursday. Um, so uh, this will actually, well, that meeting will have happened, but you and I can talk a little bit about what we can expect. Um, and, but first, actually, I actually want to start with the story about student loan forgiveness. Uh, so it was announced recently that uh, the Biden administration is going to be forgiving uh, 10, up to $10,000 worth of student loans, um, except for recipients of Pell Grants, which is going to be up to $20,000. Um, you know, I guess the to you know just outline like the pros and cons of of this decision. Uh, obviously, you know student debt is you could basically call it an epidemic in this country. You know student debt that has crossed over one point seven trillion dollars outstanding with some extremely high interest rates. By the way, if you look at the average interest rate on student debt, it's it's very very difficult uh, to pay that down. That can be anywhere from you know at the very low end like four percent up to like six seven percent. Uh, for student debt, which, which is pretty high, uh, considering where interest rates were, right, when a lot of the, these loans were originated. Um, and, you know, there's there's an immediate benefit, right? There's an unlock to relieving students, right, our youth, uh, who want to go out into the workforce and, and actually pay and do productive things. You don't necessarily want an enormous amount of their income to go towards paying down debt. Um, on the other side of things, uh, there is something that's arbitrary about this, right? I think the, the there's a lot of people who have recently paid off student debts that feel you know, understandably pretty angered about the entire situation. Like, hey, I just worked my butt off to pay down my student my student loans. Uh, why are these people getting a free ride when I'm not? So that makes it very difficult when the government is doing handouts. Like, you know, who gets the handouts and who don't? That's, that's a race they probably don't want to step into. And people are calling this kind of just cheap political win, right? Because we've got midterms coming up. And I think the Dems are worried that they're going to get smoked uh, by the GOP. What, what is your take on this, on this, Jack? Uh I think politically, there are a lot of compelling reasons to do it, but I think it is unambiguously inflationary because, you know, I think Mike, it was Mike Green who said money, the definition of money is that which cancels debt. So if you cancel debt, you are printing money. And I think that, yeah, I, I think it is inflationary. I think that uh, folks who, you know, did have $30,000 in student debt and now have $20,000 in, in student debt, they have twenty that the ten thousand dollars more and that they're going to be spending uh more so i i think it is inflationary but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's wrong you know there's a lot of extremely inflationary stuff that uh both governments uh under president trump and under president biden did in 2020 and 2021 that no one really seemed to have a big problem with you know a, a lot of uh the, the uh, uh paycheck protection program ppp uh during 2020 i mean I, there's a lot of stories of uh just, just complete fraud, and it, you know, in some cases, I think there was like a, a there was a podcast that like said it had it had twenty people, and it needed to get like you know hundreds of thousand dollars in order to keep the twenty people um, hired. So, so yeah, I, I, look, I think uh, it is inflationary, but that doesn't you, you have to subject every single piece of government action to 
to, to weigh it on its, its own merits. And that's only one piece of it, I'd say. What, I don't know. What do, you, what do you think, Mike? I think it's a it's a tricky situation politically because it's very difficult to once the government steps in and says, hey, I think you deserve uh, basically a handout here, which is which is honestly, I, I think if there was one thing that I'd be in favor of forgiving, it would be probably student loans would be right at the top of that list. Right. I, I do think it was a good thing that they distinguished just between, um, you know, they put an income cap. Right. So you're eligible if you're under one hundred twenty five thousand dollars a year in income for Pell Grants, which targets more low income. Uh, borrowers that, that they have additional forgiveness. So I think there was some thoughtfulness in terms of how it was applied. Um, and hopefully that money finds its way into the right hands. But I think just like a parent, right? If you've had the, I'm not a parent here, I know of, wink, wink, just kidding. Uh, but you know, if, you, if you've had the experience of trying to give something to, it's like, imagine trying to give one kid dessert and you've got three others that are just sitting there and don't get the dessert. It's just, it's just a very difficult thing because as soon as someone gets a handout, then the next person is going to come and say, hey, uh, you know, I think I, I deserve something here as well. Um, so I, I think it's just I, I get why it was a politically savvy move. It also targeted, you know, it's kind of in line with the Democrats kind of party line and um, it probably targets their constituents. Uh, but I think it's a I do not think it's a great road to go down, to be honest. Uh, and yeah. again, just with a historical lens on when the government starts to give away handouts, it's not a super bullish sign, I would say. <laughs> yes. The fact that it was means tested, that it's only folks below a certain level, that is something completely different than something like social security, where no matter what income you are, you get it uh, full stop. I think something like social security, where everyone gets it, that sort of safeguards it from political attack because no matter how you end up, no matter how much money you end up making, you're going to get social security. So by attacking social security, in a way you're attacking yourself. Whereas here, folks who make more than 125, they can say, oh, those people, they're getting free handouts, but not me. Uh, I think actually, and this is you know somewhat of a, of a perverse thought, but I, it is true that folks who have higher incomes and more money have a lower propensity to, to spend the marginal dollar. So, you know, if you give uh, you know, me or guy on the street, a hundred dollars, like we're much more likely to spend that a hundred dollars than let's say Elon Musk or Bill Gates. Right. So actually the fact that it's means tested and folks above $125,000 aren't going to, uh, uh, receive that debt relief. That's really not that much more. That's really, it's almost as inflationary as if it wasn't means tested at all, if that makes sense, because people who are make above that threshold, you know, is it really going to impact uh, their, their spending habits? So yeah, I look, it's, it's a cheap political victory uh, for the Democrats. And but I, I don't think it long term, it is inflationary, but uh, I, I don't think it will be short term inflationary, if that makes sense. I agree with you. I think I think the reason why I kind of uh, keyed in on this story and why I wanted to lead with it is, I you know, for a while, I've been trying to think about because um, there are kind of two different modes of thinking out there that I see represented, right, which is, one, inflation is going to change everything because we have, you know, it's just below a nine handle on inflation right now. What that means is that this era of easy money printing and low interest rates, that's going to have to end, right? And liquidity is going to have to be withdrawn from the system. And we're going to go through some sort of prolonged recession where we reset to normal valuations and then things are going to continue that way. So it's kind of like the deflationary route. And then there's another route, which is actually that can't be allowed to happen for a number of reasons. That withdrawal of liquidity, liquidity would be simply too painful. Plus, with the amount of debt that we have outstanding, we couldn't afford our interest payments. We'd essentially bankrupt ourselves. Um, so what we're going to do is just keep that. We're going to let inflation run high. We're going to let interest rates steady. And the way that we're going to you know, move forward in that kind of situation, make it bearable for people is handouts. Right, like some form of UBI. If you want to use the modern parlance, it's bread and circuses. If you want to use the ancient parlance, it's just basically targeted giving away uh, of, of money. And this is, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I'm not smart enough to know which way it's going to go. But every time you see something like this, it's a little bit of a check in in the column of uh, the latter uh, option. I would say. So that that's my personal framing when I see stories like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I also my final comment would be that folks saying, oh people are getting to go to college for free. Really, it is college is so expensive in this country, in America, that 
you're either going to, someone's going to pay for it. That's not you, you know, you're either going to get a grant or your parents are going to pay for it, or you're going to take on debt. Like the, the, oh, I sort of worked at my college and I was able not only to fund my college, but as well to generate savings because I worked through college. That is not a feasible model in 2022. Uh, Inflation over the past 40 years has been centered around healthcare and education costs. Obviously, over the past two years, it's been rising food and energy costs, but there's actually been huge you know, energy and food disinflation over the past 20 years, and particularly goods deflation, like consumer packaged goods. So you know, education is so expensive that someone's, someone's going to end up paying for it. So I think, and unfortunately, I think that the student debt relief in some ways could incentivize colleges to, to ramp up education even more. So yeah, I think college, you know, some people say college is a scam. I don't, it's not a scam. It's just, it's, it's, it's too expensive. And, um, you know, I just think there's a ton of bloat that goes on at these colleges that are officially not for profit. You know, it's, oh, the, the for-profit colleges, those are the bad guys. Unlike us, you know, we're non-for-profit. I mean, we have a $50 billion endowment and, you know, our president makes $3 million a year, but we're, you know, we're non-for-profit. So yeah, I think a lot of colleges have a lot of issues and uh, yeah, I don't really see a big solution. Should we move on to uh, the another cheery topic? <laughs> All right, Jack, let's move on to another cheerier topic. And hopefully it sounds a little clearer. I actually just plugged my microphone in. <laughs> so there you go. Um, let's talk about, uh, we've got the Jackson Hole meeting from the Fed uh, coming out this week. So I'm actually going to share my screen here briefly so you can take a look because i think what yeah. folks want to know what everyone has wanted to know for let's say the past uh six months now is how is the fed thinking about um interest rate policy right so basically here we're looking at um you know forward projections around rates so jack if you could just give us a, a summary of what we're looking at here on this chart and uh kind of summarize for us uh what you're expecting from jackson hole this friday we are lo- what we're looking at now, Mike, is the target probability range for the federal funds rate for December of 2022. Mm-hmm. Right now, the uh, rate is between 225 and 250, 2.25 and 2.50. Uh, so really, 225. Mm-hmm. So a target rate of 350, which is the largest bar in this chart now, would be. Uh, hikes of 125 basis points, so five hikes. And those five hikes would have to be uh, affected over three FOMC meetings, right? Because there's in- they only happen at meetings. You know, there was a drastic intermeeting cut in March of 2020, but really there's no, it all, it all happens at the meetings. That's where all the action is. So we had uh, a meeting in June. We had one in July. We did not have one in August this month. We're recording on Thursday, August 25th. We do tomorrow. We have Jackson Hole, where it's a summit, and it's uh, you know a lot of fancy people getting together. Uh, they, if you're a press person, they <laughs> do, do not. It's not free admittance. Uh, you have to pay. So every journalist, you know, asking a question tomorrow will will have a, their, their company will have uh, paid, which I find an interesting detail. Uh, so, but the real action will be in September, and that I believe is on the. FOMC meeting is on the 20th and the 21st. So there, the question is, is it going to be 50 basis points or 75 basis points? The market's leaning towards 75 basis points, and and I tend to agree. But yeah, I think that right now, what we're looking at this chart of, uh, oh, there's a 17% chance that it will be 325. I think that is about to get annihilated Um, tomorrow. I, I think my prediction, and this is on Thursday, August 25th. So is I have no idea, and I'm I obviously could be wrong because Powell will speak tomorrow on Friday, and this will air on Saturday, the 26th. But I think it's going to be hawkish, and I Powell, it's 15 pages. He's got a long. It's going to be a long speech. Okay, there's no ambiguity. <laughs> so what else can he do but muse over how big inflation is a problem? Uh, the really the reason I think that we've had favorable price action uh, in all sorts of risk assets over the past two months. Yes, it is some liquidity things that I'm not going to pretend I understand with the TGA and the reverse repo. So actually, money was net added. I know you're speaking to Michael Howell, the world's expert on liquidity shortly, and that uh, should air sometime next week or something. But really, I, I think it's there was no Fed meeting. Uh, and the sort of market was allowed to sort of float higher. And there's this, this, this ambient, there's this a- like ambiance of bullish dovishness that's in the background where anytime Powell doesn't speak and there's no FOMC meeting, just markets creep higher, credit spreads creep lower. But And I think that uh, Powell is back. And I, I think it's going to be a hawkish surprise. Um, you know, obviously stocks could rally, who knows. But 
I, I think that uh, the Powell pivot is 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 nowhere close. To, to, we're nowhere close to a Powell pivot. That's my outlook. Mm. Yeah, I, w- I would tend to agree with you. I think. Um, do you do you also view? You know, I know Joseph has kind of talked about this uh, before, but you know, the higher the stock market is, right, or the you know from the peak to trough, uh, whatever it's fallen, you know that that's almost leeway for for Powell to continue to raise rates. Right. That's that's my because that's my kind of operating framework. Right. Like if you look at peak to trough for the S&P 500, it's like around 20 percent. It's like less than 20 percent. So if you're Powell and you're staring down the handle of record inflation, right, which is not only difficult for you currently, but, you know, it has implications for your legacy. uh, Then, I mean, he's he's got to be saying to himself, right, is I, hey, we've only you know, we've only moved the stock market like less than less than 20%, there's still room to go. Is that kind of how you think about things as well? Or what else is, is Powell paying attention to? Right? Maybe maybe if you want to touch on fixed income and, and credit markets. Com- completely. So the bottom in S&P 500 prices, in the, the top in spreads in bond prices was around mid-June, right as the Federal Reserve was meeting on that Tuesday and on the Wednesday. And so we only got mm-hmm. the we got a quote dovish seventy five basis points instead of the a one hundred basis points, which would have been truly extreme. And at that point, asset prices were at their relative nadir. And as you say, the S and P five hundred was something like 24 percent uh, peak to trough decline. Again, a twenty percent decline is an official quote bear market. Not that that means anything, but that's just terminology. So it was the Federal Reserve's mandate of the reverse wealth effect where we have to destroy wealth in order to, so people feel less wealthy so that they spend less money so that inflation is lower. It was looking pretty good on that front. Uh, two months later, it is not looking good. Uh, and because <laughs> the S&P 500 has gone up, uh, I mean, Apple is just like 30% higher as a stock, and it's the biggest percentage of the S&P 500. Uh, a lot of junk, yeah. sort of speculative assets have... Oh my God, game... I mean, uh, Bed Bath & Beyond, from going from $8 to $26, that is not something that you see in a bear market panic collapse. So all of the hallmarks of excesses uh, of 2020 and 2021 have been apparent over the past two months. So I can't imagine, again, I could be wrong, but I can't imagine that the Federal Reserve is looking at this speculative activity and this appreciation in risk assets with anything other than displeasure. Because it is a, again, it, it, it stimulates them. They have, they have to talk the market down. They have to say, they have to hike further. They have to say quantitative tightening is going to happen no matter what. You know, No matter if there's a, an asteroid hits the earth, we're still going to be withdrawing $95 billion of liquidity every month, which by the way, begins in September. We're going to reach a full pitch on that. So yeah, I completely agree. Uh, risk assets going higher, that means the Fed has to cut more. I want to talk a little bit about this, uh, what you just said, the reverse wealth effect, right? And outline what exactly the mechanism for that is, right? So, uh, and actually Mike Howell, who again, going to be speaking to tomorrow, does a really good job of describing basically the the immense amount of financialization, right? That has happened to certainly like Western economies, right? But let's say the US economy in particular, right? So when it, when that exact effect that you're describing, right, which is the, when the price of financial assets rise, that's extremely correlated to spending, like consumer spending, which is basically like when your house is worth more money, when your stocks are worth more money, you feel more wealthy, so you are more okay spending dollars, right? And the reverse should work. So the 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 price of financial assets now has an enormous impact on the economy, the real economy, and what impacts the price of financial assets is liquidity. So I wanted to get your take on. Um, actually, there was a great Arthur Hayes piece out. Uh, Arthur Hayes, for for those of you who don't know, is uh, he is the founder of Bitmex, uh, which is basically the first crypto derivatives exchange platform, and he's recently turned into a macro blogger extraordinaire. But uh, he this one actually comes from Felix Zuloff, uh, is, uh, Jack, who I know you've interviewed in the past, um, and he's got a pretty good framework uh, for understanding liquidity conditions in the United States. So he outlines three different buckets. Um, you know, liquidity conditions being comprised of three parts. So that's the size of the Fed's balance sheet. That's probably the most well understood one, right? That's the Fed owns 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 a certain amount of uh, uh, assets, and that's usually that's treasuries and that's mortgage backed securities, right? So it's kind of a composition there. Then there's the reverse repo facility, and that's balances that are held at the New York Fed. Uh, I know you've talked about that a lot on your show, but basically that's when the the New York Fed allows for eligible counterparties to deposit 
dollars and earn a rate of return. So you can kind of thinking think about that is that's primarily money market funds that are utilizing that facility, and that's them taking dollars out of the system, basically. Um, and then uh, there's the U.S. Treasury General Account, that's the TGA, and basically you can think about that as the checking account for the Treasury, right? So when the Treasury, the United States uh, spends, right, it comes out of this this big account, the TGA. So you can think about the, these are the three um, three different factors that combine to U.S. liquidity conditions. The very simple explanation is when the Fed balance sheet goes up, that means liquidity is increasing because they're taking treasuries out, but they are putting reserves, which is basically cash for banks in the system. The RRP balance, when that decreases, that means that um, liquidity uh, goes up because, again, you can think of the RRP as basically a black hole, right? So when you're putting assets into that RRP facility, they're not interacting with the rest of the system, right? Um, And then the TGA, when the Treasury General account decreases, that means liquidity is going up because you can think of that as a checking account. So when that number is going down, that means the federal government is spending in some way, shape, or form, right? Which is liquidity positive. So basically, um, it's it's a really interesting way to think about liquidity, especially on uh, you know where people really tend to zoom in on that the federal balance sheet or the Federal Reserve balance sheet number. There are these other factors as well. And what's been interesting about that is you know we've got the RRP facility, which has been at a record high, that's starting to actually turn over, right? You're starting to see dollars drain out of the reverse repo facility. You're also starting to see the TGA drawdown as well. So, you know, we've been talking about this this bear market summer rally, right? Maybe it's low liquidity conditions. Maybe it's just an overextension of, uh, you know, the extreme fall from, you know, going into the summer. But at the same time, there are these other two, uh, you know, components to US liquidity, which are moving in a pro-liquidity Direction, right? Which is probably less well understood by the public, right? So that also could explain the recent rally in financial assets. What 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 is your take on that, Jack? Yes, I think that liquidity is an extremely important driver of fi- financial assets. I don't fully understand the interplay of the reverse repo, the Treasury General account, and the Fed's balance sheet, but I do have a lot of trust in its power of liquidity. So I, I will be listening to your interview with, with Michael Howell. I think you know mm. earnings are important and often you see a lot of intraday price action where oh, Peloton has a horrible quarter, they're down 30% after, <laughs> after hours. But really er- earnings in the long run, obviously earnings are everything. But uh, you know if, if we're in a bear market, a great quarter from Apple cannot turn a bear market into a bull market. And it, if Apple has a horrible quarter, or Google, you know, there's so many companies had the worst possible quarter. I mean, like literally, you know, they're, they're like uh, um, uh, Norwegian Cruise Lines. The cruise lines made zero dollars in you know the Q1, uh, Q2 of 2020, uh, but their their stocks went up. Why? Because liquidity. So I think liquidity is a key driver. Mike, there were a lot of interesting thoughts in Arthur Hayes's thoughts about Bitcoin. Uh, he, you know, he's a super crypto bull, but he, you know, he does acknowledge that Bitcoin is very correlated to other risk assets, which I found interesting. Um, yeah, so I would say, what what would you say is the bull case for for crypto at this time? If I'm right, that and you know that liquidity will continue to withdraw, uh, and it's going to be bad for risk assets and bad for stocks. Uh, that will be a draw down on on crypto as well. So yeah, what what did you think of what Arthur Hayes wrote about crypto? I guess I kind of have two thoughts. Maybe this is starting with Arthur's thoughts and then it'll combine to a bit of my own. I mean, the way that he described it. So he actually did a chart um, and maybe we can show it. Uh, we can show it on, on the video here, which is basically a chart of US liquidity conditions. And he charts that over the price of Bitcoin. Uh, so his, his US liquidity index, right, is a combination of those there's three things that we talked about, Fed balance sheet, RRP facility, and the TGA, right? And he charts that over the price of Bitcoin. And you can see that the price of Bitcoin is extremely correlated to liquidity conditions in the US. And the way he actually describes it is that Bitcoin is essentially a levered play on US liquidity conditions. And that's actually been described in slightly different ways by other uh, contributors as well. Like Daniel DiMartino Booth, one time she you know, outlined the, you know, the correlation between the price of Bitcoin and negative yielding debt, negative real yielding debt uh, in the world. It's all kind of saying the same thing, right? Which is, um, you know, I, I think Bitcoin is for the time being, I don't think that this is permanently going to be how it trades, but I think it's basically become 
this sort of alarm bell for liquidity conditions, or it's a levered play on liquidity conditions in the US. Um, if we go back to that framework that I kind of outlined at the beginning of this, uh, you know, this piece, I think there are two ways that things can generally go right now. I think um, we're at some sort of breaking point where either we need to try to wake up, right, and deal with the hangover and withdraw liquidity from the system and, you know, return asset values and valuations to historical norms, which will entail taking a great amount of pain, uh, in which case that's extremely bearish for Bitcoin and crypto writ large. Or there's this other version of the future where we try to inflate away a good portion of the debt and we engage in some form of financial oppression where interest rates are held lower than, than bond yields, right? And I think that's a very bullish case, essentially for Bitcoin. That that would I think that's the bear in the bull case. And I would I would guess that I think the latter scenario, the financial oppression scenario, is slightly more. I don't have a crystal ball, but like I think that's I think that's probably a little bit more realistic or or likely in the short to medium run. In the long run, I don't think Bitcoin has to trade like that forever. It's it's very it's very gold like. It's just a very it's a pristine form of collateral. I, I think it, people just want it because it's very secure. There is a fixed supply. There's comfort in that. I don't think that always means there has to be demand. I don't think there's this wall of demand necessarily incoming. But I, uh, yeah, I think for the time being, I'd be pretty comfortable with that play. Mm -hmm. Tell me. So I feel like the Bitcoin happening, I think, which happened in May of 2020, was an event that happened solely within the crypto universe. And so mm -hmm. it, it it affected crypto and nothing nothing else. Which it's in other words, it was not a macroeconomic event. And I think the another event that is is rapidly approaching is the ETH merge. Tell, explain that to me like I am a kindergartner because I am a kindergartner. And then also, what have you made, if anything, of the fact that Ethereum prices have really surged? I think from you know something like just below a thousand to nineteen hundred dollars, whereas the rally in Bitcoin and other uh, crypto assets has been impressive over the past two months, but nowhere near as explosive, like not close to a doubling. So uh, do you think that's sort of due to uh, speculation that this ETH merge will be wildly bullish for Ethereum? And if so, why? Yeah. So the, the, if we, the, what the, what the Bitcoin halving is, is there's um there's a concept, there's, there's emissions. We talk about emissions a lot in layer ones for, for, crypto protocols, right? And that's basically uh, a set inflation schedule, right? Where when you're doing mining in Bitcoin, there's a certain amount of rewards that get pro gets processed for each block, right? Successful block of transactions. Um, and what are happening is, is those rewards eventually going down, right? Um, so the, there's all else being equal, right? There are less, there's less rewards for each unit of work that gets put into secure the Bitcoin network. And, and, that's, and that's done through mining right now. That's the proof of work consensus mechanism. ETH also currently has a proof of work consensus mechanism. The transition is to a proof of stake, right? So we've kind of been in beta version of that. We've had the ETH beacon chain. There are multiple different test nets on Ethereum. You can think of test nets as like, you know, you don't want to risk the whole kit and caboodle, right? On on like a potential. So you basically have a bunch of test nets where you where you um, experiment on merging, uh, you know, different different portions of the code base. Um, so that the merge is set to go live fully on the main chain, where the beacon chain becomes the new main chain, right? And that's going to happen, I think, September fifteenth, right? So it's about twenty days from now. Um, through, without getting into the technical specifics of it, basically it drastically changes the inflation schedule of Ethereum, right? From being uh, a, a much more inflationary asset, it drastically reduces the the block rewards, right? Because it's a proof of stake system now, which is based on validators instead of miners. Um, and, and you know, depending on the demand for for block space, right? You you could ETH could essentially become a negative, a deflationary asset, right? It really changes the monetary schedule, um, and I think the bullish case for that is there's demand. There's a certain amount of demand out there for ETH uh, in general. If you drastically reduce the supply, which is what we're talking about, you know, uh, constant demand, much less supply, um, then it, it should be really bullish for a price, at least in the short term. I will say the, the way it typically trades, uh, the, the Bitcoin happening has traded in the past is a run up. Right, uh, a run up, uh, you know, kind of a drastic run up, which we've seen in ETH over the course of the last couple months, especially in the option space. Then there's a dump post merge, and then kind of a steady grind higher. 
one, one thing to to keep in mind too, if you're a traditional market participant and you're listening to this podcast, crypto are extremely inefficient markets, right? And actions tend to not get priced in well in advance. They only get priced in after, right? So that, that's just a difference. If, you, if you're thinking, well, everyone knows about this. I mean, how, how could it not be priced in? It, yeah. Crypto is just uh, very nascent in terms of this market. So these, yeah, let me these just, don't get priced it, So in for example, if uh, an FOMC day comes up and Powell raises by 50 basis points, and that seems super hawkish, and then stocks rise, you're like, why did stocks rise if the price of money increased by half a percentage? It's because the market was pricing in 75 basis points. So relative to their expectations, it was a dovish thing. And it was only a, a double hike instead of a triple hike. You're saying crypto does not do that as much because it's more of a nation market. Correct. Yeah, it just doesn't price things in. Uh, and you can see only after the thing happens uh, does price tends to react, which is just different from because I just think you have less sophisticated market participants, I would guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but, you know, th this is kind of the age old question, right, of fundamentals versus this is where it's just very difficult. Right? Like no one can really I, there aren't very many people out there who can successfully read the tea leaves when it comes to what the Fed is going to do. And people are pretty famously wrong, right, when they try to try to predict this, uh, this sort of this sort of stuff. Um, but I think the macro is is firmly in the driver's seat when it comes to crypto. But then you also have this very fundamentally bullish development in the form of the ETH merge. So what ends up happening when those two things collide? I I just I just don't know. <laughs> I, I just don't know. Um, I be, the the thing is is that I think over a longer period of time, I think this is really bullish for Ethereum. Um, and I specifically mean Ethereum price action here. You know, you're mm -hmm. what you're doing is you're transitioning ETH's monetary policy uh, to one that's much, much more deflationary than it is today. There's a lot of debate about just how deflationary it's going to be, but um, I think it's fundamentally, you know, I think it's fundamentally uh, bullish for it. In the short term, I just, I just, it's hard for me to know. <laughs> it's yeah. not a great answer for a podcast, but I just don't know. <laughs> oh, it's an honest answer. Yeah, no one knows anything. Mm. Nobody does. Yeah, they don't. Um, speaking of not knowing things, uh, I do want I do want to pick your brain for a second about. Um, I'd love to get your thoughts. Just uh, Will has prepared a bunch of charts here, uh, and maybe we can kind of go through a couple of them, right? But we're looking at you know European energy prices in general. Um, so this is actually PPI for Germany, right? Which is really you know spiking in a pretty insane way. Uh, we're also looking at Germany's trade balance, which is you know. Uh, definitely bottoming out uh, in a pretty extreme way. You're looking at this a German year ahead power price. This is a forward price, which, to your point before we got on this podcast, doesn't necessarily mean that people are paying this price for power, but it still is a pretty shocking chart nonetheless. Um, and then you can kind of, uh, I mean, this is outside of Germany, but you're looking at you know UK Euro area, so maybe that's a, a proxy for Germany, Japan, and the US. You're just looking at this is what people actually are paying. Uh, in terms of electricity and the year-over-year -year change, which is anywhere from on the low end for the U.S. Uh, sub twenty percent, it looks like around eighteen percent increase. U.K. being uh, you know just under a sixty percent increase in terms of electricity costs. Um, so you know I'd, I'd love to to get from you just specifically what you think about this increase in energy prices, whether whether or not you think that these are sustainable increases or how different economies are going to respond. Um, and then also, I'd love to get if you have any specific thoughts around around Germany because they've kind of been the economic powerhouse of the EU. The EU is under a decent amount of, I think, political pressure right now, and you know Germany really seems to have stepped in it with their energy policy. Where you know you're kind of scratching your head and being like, guys, how did you get so dependent on Russia, you know, for for your energy? And now now that there's conflict there. You know, you want to maintain and do you know the the right thing, but you're also extremely dependent uh, on a nation that you're no longer, you know, geopolitically tied to or in bed with, or, or it's just not politically palatable if you to purchase their energy at the moment. So, what what are your kind of takes here when you look at some of these charts, Jack? I think that Europe 
has an energy crisis that has plunged it already into a recession. And I think that everyone uses electricity prices. So we wonder, oh, why does Will, uh, our podcast producer who who you know, prepares these charts, how come so, so many of them are about energy prices? Well, he is the red line on this chart. He lives in the UK. Uh, and <laughs> yeah. they've seen a year-over-year increase in electricity prices of over 50%. So as much as um, the, the current... Uh, uh, administration in the U.S. can brag about, oh, we've had 60 days in a row, 70 days in a row of gasoline prices falling. That is directly tied to the price of um, uh, oil falling. And you know, oil has fallen from just above $120 to just below $90. But guess what? It's back up. The price of Brent crude is back at $100. Uh, the price of Dutch natural gas is at astronomical levels, well over $1,000 per barrel equivalent of, of oil. I don't even think it makes sense to compare it to a barrel of oil anymore. Uh, more than double what it was uh, in mid-June when we had the double uh, ex- extremely hawkish uh, Federal uh, Reserve uh, meeting. And yeah, I, I think to some degree, energy is fund- fungible. Obviously, you know, if I have a barrel of oil at $100 here where I am and you have it at $50 where you are, it makes sense for you to ship it to me and to profit from the the, the, diff- the difference. Uh, obviously, with natural gas, it's a lot more difficult because it typically goes through pipelines and to transport it overseas, you need to liquefy it and compress it into liquefied natural gas, LNG, and then it needs to be regasified uh, once it uh, uh, get uh, gets lands lands on shore, but yes, I think if the price of natural gas in Europe is astronomically high, it will make sense for companies like Chenier, uh, L- whose ticker is LNG, or uh, another company whose ticker is FLNG, where they export natural gas. It's going to make sense to ship money, uh, sh- ship natural gas from the U.S., from Qatar, from Australia to Europe. So I think that will continue to that will be a booming industry, uh, liquefied natural gas. Uh, and I think also it's, it will be a bull market for coal, uh, which it's funny, you know, the, it's not I mean, it's not funny, but the the uh, ruling party in Germany forsook natural, excuse me, forsook nuclear power, because it was dirty, it had a lot, a lot of uh, you know toxic issues with it. And they said, Okay, well, we're going to rely on solar, we're going to rely on wind. Well, now that Russia has cut them off, they have to rely on coal once again, which is, as we know, th- the dirtiest fuel. So, so I think that a lot of this will continue to exert inflationary pressure that is completely out of, cont- of control of, of central bankers. I mean, regardless of what Christine Lagarde, Jay Powell does, if LNG is going to go from 100 euros to 300 euros, that's what it's going to do, regardless of what any central banker wants. Uh, so in the US, you know, we actually... Be- in part because of the shale revolution, we are uh, energy independent and we are actually net exporter mm-hmm. uh, liquefied natural gas. And I actually, we we are currently the biggest liquefied natural gas exporter in the world, which wasn't true uh, at the beginning of this year, but it is true now. So because of that, and because the dollar is the is the king, Jay Powell can raise rates. And uh, that's why we're forecasting 355, 350 basis points by the end of the year. He can enact quantitative tightening. He can reduce the size of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. Christine Lagarde, uh, head of the European Central Bank, she does not have that luxury. Uh, she has hiked central basis. Uh, uh, she has hiked the benchmark rate. I believe it's now at zero percent, whereas U.S. were in two hundred and twenty-five basis points. And has she? started to tighten balance sheet? No, 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 no. As a matter of fact, she's they don't call it QE, but they have a special mechanism in order to essentially prop up the debt of the uh, southern countries, particularly Italy, uh, so that the spread between German German bonds and Italian bonds doesn't doesn't widen too far. Uh, so she, the European Central Bank, uh, they have a lot of because they because inflation is so high, right? PPI is at thirty seven percent. So what do you do when inflation is is high? You hike interest rates. But the economy is already so fragile, and there's so much um, uh, um, insolvent debt that it really will it re- i mean that's what people say i mean i don't know if it's true that you can't hike interest rates people say you can't hike interest rates but i don't know i mean there's only one way to find out right <laughs> but um mike um, I, I you i want your final comment on this but then also i think the topic of insolvent debt is a great transition to our final topic which is chinese real estate mm, yeah all right so i i you know it's it's hard for me to really comment on on the european situation because i i'm i 
feel so fundamentally like I don't understand where they're coming from a lot of the time. Um, I I think it's again like we so Luke Grumman was the interviewee of of this week. Uh, you know, he kind of took it all the way back to the Bretton Woods system. I think it's important to remember that the EU and the euro specifically was a pretty radical experiment, right? That was union through a united monetary policy. And that has worked, albeit with some, you know, pretty significant disruptions, you know, but it, it, over, over the past, you know, 50, uh, you know, 50 some odd years. Um, but it hasn't really been tested uh, enormously because we, we've, there's been a, a pretty, a, a pretty long period of prosperity, right? So, you know, you mentioned a very critical spread, right? The spread between German and Italian bonds, right? Germany, again, being the powerhouse, right? And, you know, that seat of fiscal and economic, uh, both prosperity and, and prudence in Europe and uh, Italy, which as an Italian, I feel fine saying this is, well, they're one of the pigs, right? <laughs> so they're kind of the inverse of that, right? So right. that Portugal, spread Italy, is, is a measure Greece, of stress. Spain. Yeah, the southern countries. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so... I think what you're seeing is that is that is f- stress in the financial system appearing in Europe, but it's really a testing of this idea of union through a common monetary policy. And Germany, you know, the reason why we highlighted electricity prices and just the the German, uh, you know, the German situation is they're really kind of the canary in the coal mine because in many ways they've been holding the EU together, um, and. You know the UK is out, right? They've they've did their Brexit, and so I think it's very important to, to just be paying attention to when I think about why why is Will putting together some of these charts. What I'm thinking is it's very important. Germany is the canary in the coal mine. If you see if you see an enormous amount of stress appear there, they are they're kind of the glue that holds the EU together. So I, you know, I, I don't have any special insight in terms of how that situation is going to develop. Uh, you know, to your point, you know, when you look at something like energy forwards, it's more complicated. Like people aren't necessarily paying for those prices today. Yeah, they're not, I, they're I, not. I, I would highlight that that's that's not, you know, that doesn't mean people's electricity prices of fourteen x. You know, but but it is indicative, right? Yeah. I mean, it is indicative of a market that's breaking and under extreme duress. But so, but but it can mean I, that's the, the government, the the, uh, the people aren't paying fourteen x for the electricity. But in some cases, it can mean the government is paying fourteen x, and they are. Only they, they are defraying that cost and uh, swallowing that cost essentially themselves, and only imposing a mere fifty percent increase on 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 people. So someone is paying that, and if, if that's governments, that will mean uh, fiscal surpluses turned into fiscal deficits. Right. So it's you know I think it's it's I think it's a tough situation, and I, I would also highlight that when you see these numbers on chart. You know, on a chart, it's what's you know, it's very tempting to be like, "Wow, look at that! That's crazy." Just remember that these are people's lives. You know, yeah. I mean, energy is so critical. The reason why I highlight it so much is, um, I actually really, I think Doomberg was the one who said this. You know, energy is life. Energy is human life. It's the one thing that all people need, right? I mean, you you could pro- maybe appropriately denominate your life in terms of barrels of oil consumed. Um, and that's not something that I necessarily would have thought about, but that that's your that's the critical input for human life is energy. So when you see these costs running up, it's a, it's a dire situation. I think to just keep in mind. Mm-hmm. Um, let's move on to our final topic of Chinese real estate. Jack, I know you've been digging into this uh, quite a bit. You want to set the scene for why you want to chat about this? Sure. So as some viewers know, the Chinese real estate sector is under a lot of stress. First began to appear about a year ago when bonds of property developers started to deteriorate, uh, ultimately living in the giant uh, uh, real estate developer Evergrande, declaring bankruptcy. And the contagion has spread uh, when Evergrande and other property developers, uh, some of whom have declared bankruptcy, others of whom are only effectively insolvent but haven't effectively declared bankruptcy, they don't have money to build properties. And that is a problem because so many Chinese people do they what do they inv- they have extra money? Do they invest in stocks like the U.S.? No, they invest in real estate, mm. and often they buy properties on spec, meaning that they buy a property and they essentially make themselves a debtor uh, in exchange for a property that does not yet exist. So many, so a lot of people have they owe money on a mortgage that was for a property to be developed by Evergrande, and I've read some of these um, mortgage boycotts and. They, Evergrande has not built the property. Uh, so they say, hey, no property, no money. And that 
you know, if a hundred people do that, the system can take it. But if a hundred million people do that, it starts to destabilize really quickly. So you've seen uh, mm. China, and I say China, of course, it's different parties begin to intervene. And I, I don't know how many weeks ago it was. I, I know we were in Denver when I first read this article, but there were not the People's Bank of China, but uh, state-owned entities that were essentially giant investment firms that happened to be owned by the Chinese government begin to it, it inject uh, billions of dollars into the system. And now, uh, again, on uh, Thursday, August 25th, we see the latest development of that where uh, China plans, again, it hasn't happened yet, it's rumored, China plans $29 billion in special loans to troubled developers. Uh, so the loans to be used for completing sold but unfinished properties. Again, they have sold these properties, but the properties, in effect, do not exist. The beams are not in the house. The roof does not exist. They need to, The nails need to be nailed in. Uh, so the People's Bank of China and the Finance Ministry are to channel money via the policy banks, state-owned enterprises. So really, the bailout in the Chinese sector is moving into its next phase, where it, instead of essentially like uh, shadow investment firms that are, in effect, owned by the Chinese government, it's the People's Bank of China itself uh, uh, conducting the bailout. Will it be enough? We'll see. Yeah. What are the what are the broader implications here? Right. When you saw, you know, when you, you go rewind the clock to 2008, right, we saw an implosion in the U.S. real estate sector, which rippled out, you know, to the entire global economy, caused probably the worst financial crisis in the last, you know, 40 some odd years. Right. Um, maybe maybe ever. Right. Staring into the abyss, uh, as it were. Um, you know, my understanding is that in, in China, they, they have a greater just the way their economic system is structured. Right. Because China can command counterparties, right? Unlike the United States uh, to just accept or transmit payment or whatever, um, that you kind of have more of a limited fallout. Uh, there's less uh, credit contagion that spreads from from these sort of implosions in, in China's financial system. But what are, the, what are the broader implications that people should be understanding about the stress on the Chinese real estate sector? Theoretically, uh, conceptually, it's simple. So Chinese China is a giant consumer of commodities, steel, iron, mm. copper, natural gas, coal, oil. And that is the engine that drove commodity prices higher in the commodity super cycle that began in this decade uh, from 2000 to 2008 and then from 2009 to 2014, let's say. So a slowdown of that economic engine would mean lower prices of all commodities, particularly uh, industrial metals like iron that are very key to uh, construction. Again, construction is China's biggest industry. Uh, so, you know, I actually looked at shorting some, you know, when, when Evergrande bonds first started dipping lower about a year ago, I looked at shorting some, you know, uh, iron miners in Australia, as well as some very economically sensitive, China sensitive, I should say, stocks like, um, What's it called? Uh, you know, Chinese luxury companies mm. where fifty percent of the coats that they buy are bought by these, you know, Chinese uh, communist officials. Um, and I figured, oh, you know, the, chi- the economy would slow down, and also uh, President Xi uh, sort of Westernism is kind of out of style. It, it's uh, it's passe in China. Fortunately, I, I didn't I didn't short any of those. And short, uh, unfor- I was fortunate I didn't because uh, it didn't happen. Uh, so. Just because uh, a sector can slow down doesn't mean that what you think is going to happen uh, will happen. I know China is a huge consumer, continu- continues to gorge itself on all sorts of natural resources. Uh, so, so I really don't know, Mike. Mm. I think it's a t- I think it's it's a tough thing to know. I think what, what's it in the last chart that we'll show here? Maybe we can sort of end on this. Um, is there's a, there's a great chart from our from our mutual friend uh, Jim Bianco, basically just on just how disrupted, uh, you know, just how bad of a start to year it's been for bonds writ large, right? Uh, so what what you're looking at here is year to date total returns for the Bloomberg Global Aggregate Index of bonds, and it is it is the worst year on record, and in, you know, by by quite a bit, right? Um, you know, by it, that. At its nadir, right, uh, just under sixteen percent uh, decline. We're sitting at right about, um, you know, a fifteen percent decline, just under a fifteen percent decline, right now. You know, I think it's actually been pretty remarkable that there have really to date only been major blowups or credit crises um, in the most highly levered sectors, right? So that's kind of Chinese real estate, 
that's crypto, right? Um, and largely, you know, we've definitely seen panic and doom and gloom and some retraction in, in asset prices or maybe something that looks like a, the beginning of a, a correction towards the mean. But we really haven't seen many uh, other, you know, credit crises, certainly not ones that ripple out uh, throughout the financial system. So I think that's, that's where I would kind of end it uh, or, just, or just highlight that that's, that's an abnormality in general. Um, so it's been a tough start to the year, but I, I don't think it's been as bad as it could have been. I totally agree. And I think that the reason that bonds, again, quote bonds, there's so many different things, but the Bloomberg Global Aggregate Index of bonds has suffered so much, as you can see in this blue, dark blue line on the chart, and you haven't seen a credit crisis is because, so to speak, the call is coming from within the house. It's be, the, People are selling bonds, not because bonds are going to default, but because they fear a, an essence, a soft default of inflation. So they are selling their duration. They're selling their longer term bonds and they're going to cash. They're going to other things and they're, they're just valuing it less or they're selling it so they can afford the 50% uh, increase in electricity prices. And then this index, it has high yield, investment grade, uh, mortgages, as well as duration. So when I look at this rally from mid-June uh, up until August 1st, I have to say, the decline from August 1st until now does surprise me because I'm pretty sure from June until now, high yield spreads have narrowed, investment grade spreads have narrowed, mortgage spreads have narrowed. So this decline really must be due to duration, uh, which just goes to show people are worried about inflation. Inflation, inflation, inflation. That's what I think Jay Powell is going to be talking about on Friday. I Actually, I wonder uh, I wonder how many times he's going to say the word inflation. Um, Do you have an over-under? Uh, I'll go over I'll go over, I'll go over 20. 15 pages, I, I'd be shocked if he was under at least 1.5, uh, you know, mentions of inflation per page. Yeah. You got to be. Well, gotta Mike, be. that's how you make a prediction. And it's at, in the prediction is you make it very easy on yourself, you know? <laughs> it's like, yeah, I think uh, this football game, I think they're going to score uh, two touchdowns, at least, perhaps three. <laughs> perhaps three. Perhaps, yeah, that's, uh, that's a good way to make a bet, Jack. It's a good way to make a bet. I, I, I'll take the, I, I can't really take the, I'll, I'll increase, I would say at least 30 got to be at least there now i'm not going to be there fact checking but maybe someone on twitter or a, a listener of this show uh you know if you want keep track of the amount of times that that pal mentions the word inflation um and maybe we can send you a th- there's going to be a little 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 prize yeah. that mark and i are announcing next week anyway so um there and if you say if you include the word price increases i think it's it's easily going to be over 30 the final hint i'll drop is that people i filmed an interview with joseph wang recently as well as with uh, Mish Shedlock, Joseph has changed his mind. Joseph thinks that Powell is going to pivot. Not tomorrow, of course, but he thinks that the interest rate futures market is more in line with the reality than it has been historically. Obviously, in December, the the forward rate was you know probably below 100 basis points, which turned out to be wildly inaccurate. Joseph thinks you know they'll likely get to four percent, but he thinks that the six percent sort of Zoltan posts are doom scenario is uh less likely and Zoltan, he said Powell, uh um joseph said that he said arthur Byrne, <laughs> powell is weak and he's arthur burns <laughs> so <laughs> it's it's powell's job to prove joseph wang wrong because we've had a wang pivot but i don't think we're gonna have a powell pivot yeah i i i kind of feel like there is a the fed has their dual mandate right they've got price stability and they've got unemployment but i think they're the real what those mandates try to describe is the real job of the Federal Reserve, which is to fund and ultimately keep together the United States, right? Like it, it is an arm of the government. I know it's separate, big air quotes, separate, right, from other branches of government. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, if they have price stability, but, you know, they have to tank the entire US economy to do it and their bread lines, I, you know, I just don't think that they will. I think there is a higher mandate, frankly, than price stability is what I really believe. So mm-hmm. um, now I think it'd have to be pretty dire to get there. But yeah, I, I'm. It's interesting to hear Joseph pivoted. That that kind of aligns with my personal viewpoint around it as well. But I don't know. I guess we'll have to see. Yeah, I'm gonna be. I'm not gonna make my. I'm, I'm not gonna fire the gun of uh, saying the Powell is going to pivot until until at the last possible moment. <laughs> So I can still claim I'm, that I'm right. You know, I'm, I'm going to wait till see the, the whites of uh, that, the eyes of the whites that call, eyes. just as the Fed waited to see the whites of the eyes of inflation. And we all know that worked out great. Right? Yeah, yeah. Really good policy <laughs> choice there. You know, you know what I also, you know what I also though believe that that's the case is because no one's even talking about, I know I sound like I'm 50 years old saying this, but nobody's even talking about balancing the budget. 
Like nobody, nobody even has a clear line of sight, right? Let alone, you yeah. know, it, no, no one can even explain how you are going to balance the budget. That's why I think it has to be inflation and financial oppression. I because no one can even explain how we're going to stop printing trillion dollar deficits into perpetuity. And that's obviously right. not sustainable. Like people need to just put their well, hat. That's because we're so far away from balance a balanced budget. We briefly, briefly, all Larry Summers and all those Robert Rubin, all those sort of great people, they they all worked so hard in 1999 to make sure we had a budget surplus for one brief year. And then it's just been a slow decline. So I think structurally the US under a Democrat has that played was. the role. Yes, yes, exactly. Um yeah, I mean look, but I mean Democrats and Republicans, uh, their record on balanced budgets is both poor. But again, saying poor, that implies that we should have a balanced budget. The U.S. is the I think if the U.S. were to run a persistent surpl- uh, uh, current account s- surplus, that we would have to have a drastically different economic order in which, you know, uh, China, I mean, c- currently, quote, it, it works. You know, China, they have trillions of surplus and they recycle into treasury that that's worked over the past 20 20 years we'll see i was gonna say yeah we're so far away from a balanced budget that it to even talk about a balanced budget i mean we're trillion dollar uh deficits as far as the eye can see so it's kind of like you know if you and i formed a company that was like making electric vehicles and the company was literally just out of our garage but despite the fact that we're in a garage we don't have any electric vehicles don't be confused and like you know we didn't have any revenue it's like you can't talk about uh Profit before you talk about revenue. You know, you can't talk about balanced budget before you talk about lowering the debt, the deficit. So, um, yeah, we'll see. I also will point out though that you can have a persistent deficit and still have low inflation, and that's what we've seen over the past decade. But yeah, Roger. Yeah. All right, Jack. I think that's where we gotta draw it to an end here. Um, thank you very much, my friend. Forward marginal guidance. Always a pleasure when we get to do this. Um, been a blast. I'll chat with thank you soon. You. Mike two fifty. Link in description. My dead Jack 252. And also, by the way, Damn it, I'm a gentleman. Yeah, but my, my, uh, the Jack Farley portfolio, for, purely for the purpose of this show, be long por- uh, permies and short the S&P 500. <laughs> That's, that is an epic uh, swing trade right there. Um, Jack, my friend, yeah. cheers. We'll do it again soon. Cheers. Cheers.